Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. Before we get into today's show, I have an incredibly important announcement. This is something that I really haven't been more excited to announce than all the way back in 2014 when I first started the Energy Blueprint. After well over a year of development and testing, we are finally ready to officially launch our breakthrough mitochondrial supplement to the world. This is a genuine game changer in the area of human energy enhancement, and it's called Energenesis. This is actually the first no stimulant, no caffeine, and no sugar energy formula that actually builds up your own body's capacity to produce energy. Instead of working like caffeine and stimulants by giving you a temporary boost of energy for a few hours, but ultimately making your energy levels worse over time, Energenesis actually builds up your own body's ability, your cellular capacity to produce energy. Energenesis got over 20 amazing, powerful ingredients at real effective doses. This is a premium formula that uses actual real effective doses. So this is literally like 23 supplements all in one. And with that in mind, just to mention a few testimonials that people have wrote in after using Energenesis. So this one's from Barbara. She said, I'm a 72 year old female and I love, love, love Energenesis. I have more sustained energy through the day and I'm actually getting my life back. I'm doing things that I haven't been able to do for 10 years. Anya, she said, I really love that it gives me just the right kind of steady and balanced energy. Unlike stimulants, which I can't tolerate, Energenesis gives me a perfect smooth kind of energy that lasts throughout the whole day. Michelle Catlin, this is one of my favorite ones, she said, um, Ari, are you getting tired of all the praise and requests for Energenesis yet? I'm on my third bottle and I have to tell you, I haven't felt this good in years. So if you've been struggling with your energy levels and you're looking to get this area of your life handled, and not just to get a temporary boost of energy for a few hours, but to actually transform your energy levels by building real energy at the cellular level, then go get yourself some Energenesis. You can get it at theenergyblueprint.com forward slash Energenesis. So go to that page, check out all the ingredients and all the science behind it, how it works. It's all there. There's about 200 scientific references behind all of the different ingredients in Energenesis. They're all listed on that page along with a lot of the science behind the ingredients. There's also a video explaining it all. Check it all out. Check out the science, then grab yourself some Energenesis and let's get started. I know that you are going to be blown away by the result. The URL is theenergyblueprint.com forward slash Energenesis. And now let's get into the episode. Hey there, this is Ari Witten, and welcome to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. Today I have with me Dr. Becky Gillaspie, who graduated summa cum laude with research honors from Palmer College of Chiropractic in 1991. She has worked on as an on-air health consultant for a local ABC TV affiliate and spent most of her professional career teaching a range of college courses from anatomy to nutrition. She now works full-time helping people reach their health and weight loss goals through her website and YouTube channel that has a following of over 250,000 people. So welcome, Dr. Dr. Becky or Dr. Yes. Gillespie. Dr. What, do you, what do you prefer to be yeah. called? Uh, Dr. Becky is usually how people refer to me, so that okay. that works just fine for me. Becky is perfectly fine too, Ari. Okay, great. So um, obviously you are, by education, a chiropractor, a doctor mm -hmm. of chiropractic. Uh, I'm just curious, how did you transition from that to kind of, it sounds like more, really more than anything, weight loss is your focus now. So how did, I'm, I'm just curious about the, the background there. Yeah. Um, so I uh, started in practice. I graduated in 91, uh, practiced for quite a few years. My daughter was born. I kind of took a, it kind of took my, li my life on a different trajectory. I wanted a little bit more steady hours and I had always enjoyed teaching. So I had uh, started teaching. Uh, I actually, my first teaching job was teaching uh, medical uh, assistants and uh, teaching them a range of different courses anatomy, physiology, all the way to nutrition and everything in between. And uh, I found that I really, really in enjoyed that. And then as online education started to come into play, uh, I moved and shifted to online education and really just, it all kind of blossomed out from that. Uh, I then started my, my blog. Uh, I was actually one of my kind of 
interim jobs when you're kind of, you know, getting, you know, your life in, in order was um, as a, uh, a, a science writer. So I would write uh, online articles uh, that were then turned into videos and uh, they were on a, a range of, of topics. Um, they're here again, anything from anatomy to, to nutrition. And so it, you know, it really just developed from that. And then when I started my blog, uh, I would talk about these types of topics and I would always come down to, okay, can you help me with my diet? Because you know, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with, with weight loss. And that is really how it, how it evolved. It really became, this is the need that is out there. This, that became my focus and that really became my focus of research and then as, as, so as more and more people were coming just with this problem of weight loss, it led you kind of very naturally just to focus more and more on that piece of the puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Got it. So let's talk about weight loss. So what, I guess to start with, what, how do you conceptualize the problem of sort of more broadly the obesity epidemics that have occurred mm -hmm. in most Western countries? And, uh, and really the problem of fat gain, what are the factors that drive fat gain in the, in the first place? Right. So, you know, what it comes down to is for the past 60 years, we were always on this, this calorie model, you know, calories in calories out. So it, it, it was a very simple model that really made sense in our heads because well, if you, if you are putting on some weight, well, you're probably taking in more calories then your body needs and your body has to store them and therefore you, you gain weight. You want to do that in reverse while you take in fewer calories than, you, than you're eating. And so it, it's, it was a very logical system. Um, unfortunately, something it didn't take into account was that our body is always striving for homeostasis, which is a fancy way of saying balance. Um, you know, think about your body temperature, right? 98.6. And it doesn't vary too much from, from that point, right? Maybe a little bit up, a little bit down, but for the most part, 98.6. Well, there's, there's homeostatic mechanisms inside of our body that make sure that we stay in that very narrow range. Our metabolism is very similar. Um, our metabolism wants homeostasis. It wants uh, a, a balance. So if we are taking in fewer calories, it says, okay, we don't have as much energy coming in. Let's cut down on the amount of energy that we're burning. And that's actually, you know, what we saw with the Biggest Loser study that was out just a few years ago, where they um, looked at participants that had taken part in the Biggest Loser uh, program. And if there's somebody who doesn't know what that was, or maybe in a different country watching this, um, the basis, basic premise of the show was get these people who have been overweight for, for many years on this show, cut their calories a lot, have them exercise a lot, and it's a race to see who can lose the most weight. Um, it worked, right? I mean, most of them lost, lost weight. However, this Biggest Loser study that has now kind of become iconic uh, showed that their metabolism searched for and found this l new low level of homeostasis. And now, even six years after they were on the show, their metabolisms have, have dropped to the point where they can't eat uh, the same amount of calories without, without gaining weight. So we needed, we needed to look for a different model than the calorie model. It, it, it it was effective, but as far as long term, it's 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 going to be challenging if weight loss is your goal. And what we were overlooking was was hormones. Uh, one hormone in particular, insulin, is extremely important to our body's ability to lose weight. Um, insulin is what we would call an anabolic hormone, so that means that it builds up, right? So it uh, you know if if you have a type one diabetic, they can't make insulin and and they can't they can't thrive, they can't live unless they have an artificial form of insulin. Well, you know, so we want insulin in our bodies. The, the, the challenge for us is that in our modern day society, we take in a lot of energy. 
from our foods and uh, we are, are more sedentary than we used to be. So we're, we're um, having excess energy. Well, that excess energy has to go somewhere and that goes into storage. Uh, some of it can go into our muscles, glycogen. So we have kind of a quick energy source that we can pull from. But if there's more, uh, it, it gets parked in the places on our body that are a ever expanding area of storage and that is our, our fat cells. So we found that uh, the, the, the old ways of looking at calories um, had some limitations. And now we've kind of come to this place in the past re really decade that it's really taken off that weight loss, weight gain, those are hormonally uh, driven processes. And so if we can eat in a way that keeps insulin low uh, and, and our blood sugar steady, so insulin stays low, then we can make some uh, inroads into weight loss. Gotcha. So let's... Um dig into some of the details here in particular. So going back to the biggest loser. So you, you did know that people who just followed this simple calories in calories out approach, who were just kind of put on a low food diet, low calorie diet, um, did in fact lose lots of weight. The issue is the regaining. So if, if it's, so let me put it this way. Um, if it's more hormone, if it's more about hormones than less about calories, why is it that the people who were in the Biggest Losers lost weight at all? And why is it that you know in studies we know that if you put people on low calorie diets, they do lose weight very predictably and reliably? So what, if, like I, I guess you're saying calories are not that important. There's other factors that are important too, but we we do have to acknowledge that calories are at least a factor that has mm -hmm. a large impact on body fat mass. So what is the role of calories versus hormones? Yeah. So, so calories are important and I can, I can, uh, I will get to that. Um, but let me address what you were talking about with the, the study. So uh, the biggest loser participants did work, did lose weight. They, they ate a low calorie diet, uh, low calorie diets in the research show that uh, it's good for longevity. Um, there are, there are some benefits to low calorie diets. The, the problem was though, that the body adapted to that. And at that point, then you have to stay low calorie or you're going to regain weight. So, so that's, that's, that's kind of, that was, the, that was the challenge. Yep, low calorie will work. It'll get your weight down, but your metabolism will find that new that new level of balance and now you're now you're struggling because you you don't want to stay as low low calorie and now it's easier to to gain weight uh so what is the role of of calories you know there's there's a lot of people that will argue that if you get this hormone balance right that um calories don't matter eat to satiety and I, and I think there, is, there are some people that that will work for, but those people are um, young, haven't, had, haven't collected any metabolic effects that, that are now challenging to them. Uh, you know, a, a lot of my audience is, is over the age of 50. We've um, been challenged by weight, you know, through these, through these decades. And now we have... Um, some metabolic, I guess I'll call it metabolic debt that we've kind of, that we've kind of carried. And so to tell somebody who has been overweight for 30 years um, that they can just lose weight um, by eating, you know, as many calories as, as they want, I don't think that they're going to be as happy with their results. So I do find that there, there is a, a balance with calories. Um, when I coach somebody on, on finding that balance, and I will, I will be the biggest one to say, uh, counting calories is such an imperfect system. You, you know, to try and get that right by just, you know, it, it, if you're not in the lab, you know, how many calories exactly you need to run your body. Um, it's an imperfect science, but we can get, we can get closer. Uh, one thing that, that I like to do is figure out a person's lean mass and then 
adjust the calories so that they that they are eating to support their lean their lean mass. Uh, so we kind of find that number so that they they never fall be below that uh, because you want to eat enough calories to support your muscle, but you don't necessarily have to eat that many calories to support your fat. Fat is not metabolically active, so. Finding, you know, that's, that's one of the little tweaks that I, I like to look at, you know, um, setting calories, finding that area where your lean mass, okay, how many calories would it take for supporting your lean mass? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So um, I think with the idea of fat mass being regulated, there's, there's, there's definitely lots of evidence to support that. But my understanding around um, insulin and carbs is that most of the evidence that is tested that the carbohydrate theory of obesity has really found that insulin, while it is one of many different things that, that plays a role in fat storage, it is not the thing that regulates fat storage. So for example, um, there's been metabolic ward studies where they've put people on low fat and low carb diets, even ketogenic diets of equal calories. And uh, they, despite differences in insulin, they lose the exact same amount of fat. There's mm -hmm. also overfeeding studies where they put people on low fat versus low carb, high fat studies of equal calories where you're eating in a caloric surplus and they gain the same amounts of fat. So um, from what I've seen, insulin is not a really compelling mechanism of sort of regulating this fat thermostat that this you know, lipostat, how, how, you know, our body fatness. Um, but I would have no disagreements with the, the, uh, the conclusion that refined sugar and refined carbohydrates are one of the key factors that do drive chronic overconsumption of, of calories and, and lead to, to fat gain. And that removing those things can absolutely drive fat loss. Yeah. Um, so, so carbohydrates run, run the gamut. Uh, we have sugar and spinach are both what we would classify as carbohydrates. Um, now, I would I would say um, we have a there's a definite difference in the way that those two foods will affect the body. Um, certainly, you take in sugar; it's in its most refined form. Uh, it takes nothing for your digestive system to take that allow it to be absorbed into the blood and then there goes your, your blood sugar. Uh, spinach, on the other hand, that is going to have to be processed. It's got a lot of nutrients, uh, phytonutrients, um, things that are going to slow down the digestion. It's got volume to it probably because you're eating a, a good amount. All of these things are going to help to slow the digestion. Um, also, it's just not refined. It's not going to be sugar. So you're not going to have a, a influx of, of sugar. Now, when we have an influx of sugar, um, we do get an, an insulin, the insulin driving up at the same time. And, and it, when we have all of that energy, all of that blood sugar in our system, it has to be put into storage. Um, high blood sugar is a very inflammatory state for the body to be in. It's not, it's not comfortable to have that high blood sugar. So we do need to move that into storage as quickly as possible. Well, so just to play devil's advocate, where does the fat go? If you eat a bunch of fat in a meal, what happens mm -hmm. to that? Well, so um, it, it will uh, be broken down much slower. Um, insulin is a nutrient storing hormone, so it can uh, put it into, into fat storage. But um, you know, what I, what I have found with, with working with people, um, it, uh, it, it seems to be such a slow digestion, uh, that our bodies are able to run on it longer before putting it into storage. Um, whereas if we have a lot of sugar and, 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 and of course, obviously I think most, any, uh, person who talks about a healthy diet, we're going to talk about a lack of sugar. Um, sugar is the diet destroyer for, for everyone. Uh, but when we, when we have that, then we have to get rid of that because that is such an inflammatory state. Gotcha. Okay. So certainly refined carbohydrates, refined sugars are a big problem that is driving people to gain fat uh, and is a factor that, that help that prevents people from losing fat uh, mm -hmm. effectively. 
is that the only factor? So is the solution just as simple as, hey, go on a low carb ketogenic diet or is there more to the story? Yeah. So, you know, keto diets have come into, into um, popularity um, and, and I do see some benefits to, to a keto diet, um, but do, does everybody need to go into a, a keto diet? I, I don't, I don't think so. And, I, and I've seen it. I, I don't eat a ketogenic diet, but I do eat low. I do keep a fairly low intake of carbohydrates. So what is the difference? Where is the lining there? Just if people are interested, um, there's no, there's no, um, uh, overall, uh, uh, consensus on what makes a, a diet low carb, what makes a, a diet keto. But generally what we'll see is, is if you keep below 125 grams of carbs a day, uh, you're in the low carb range. If you go up below 50, you're going to be put your body in a point to where it will pr produce ketones because it's not getting the glucose that it would normally use. Um, oh, um, so you were talking about uh, keto, uh, low carbon is sugar the only thing? No. Um, so anything that's going to keep our blood sugar stabilized uh, is what I find to be really beneficial. And for a number of reasons. So you're, you're not going to be having to uh, quickly get rid of that blood sugar and push it into storage. And also it keeps your hunger and cravings under control. So anytime we can keep, we can eat in a way that prevents spikes in, in sugar because then that's going to, to drop us and that's going to cause cravings and things of that sort. Um, it, we're going to be beneficial. So what kinds of foods do that? So obviously getting, uh, eating a low sugar diet, um, eating uh, whole carbs that have a good fiber to carb ratio is important. So if we're looking at like leafy greens, for instance, um, they're the amount of fiber that they have compared to carbohydrates oftentimes will come almost like a one-to-one -one ratio. So fiber is going to slow the digestion. It's going to slow the amount, the rate that uh, the food is getting broken down and going into our system. That's going to give us nice sustained energy for a, a, a long time. And that's, that's going to be beneficial. Healthy fats. Um, I would also in include them and um, they would be your whole fats. Uh, so nuts, seeds, raw nuts, seeds, not uh, ones that are cooked in our vegetable oils, which I can, we can get into some unhealthy fats as, as well. Uh, avocados, um, fatty fish that's wild caught. So we, we don't have the contaminants as, as much to worry about. Those types of foods are going to help also because they're not going to cause that spike in blood sugar that causes that spike in insulin and they're going to keep our blood sugar steady they're going to keep us feeling satisfied for much longer um, and that also plays into intermittent fasting which maybe is something that we can kind of jump into at some point too yeah and let's go there right now so the obviously the the, the types of food that we're choosing i, I think you're uh correct me if I'm wrong, you're of the opinion that the, the macronutrient, the carb to fat ratio matters quite a bit, as well as uh, the quality of the food. So whether it's whole food, unprocessed food versus processed food matters, uh, and the timing of the food matters. So yes. let's, um, uh, before we get to the timing, let's just one more layer on whole food versus processed food. What is it about whole food versus processed food that is sort of the key, the key factor that, that makes processed food more fattening than, than whole food? Yeah, well, there's, there's many, many things. Um, and maybe not uh, all of them on just fattening, but on just not being good for us. So, um, you know, a whole food is going to have everything in, in intact. So it's, it's going to take a lot for our bodies to, to process that. Uh, when, we, when we start to refine things, we start to process them. Uh, a lot of times we'll do things that will increase their shelf life so that they can be packaged and stay on the shelf. Uh, things that increase shelf life are getting rid of the things that will rot, right? So when we refine foods, we take away the, the parts of the, the grain, for instance, that, that, will, that will cause the, 
food to spoil. Unfortunately, when we do that, then that is also removing the nutrients. Um, so we have this product that will stay on the shelf longer. It's a processed snack or something of that sort, uh, but it's, it's basically void of, of the nutrients that it had before. So, you know, processed foods, uh, we're, we're not doing our, our bodies any good um, by, by eating them. They're also going to have possibly some artificial sweeteners in, in them. And, you know, we've, uh, my, my husband and I have uh, done some tests on artificial sweeteners and uh, to see what they do to our blood glucose, um, see what they do to, to ketones. And they actually have a, um, there are some of them that will raise our, our glucose. Um, maltitol is a sugar alcohol and it's used a lot of times in, to sweeten things up. It actually has, it has an uh, insulin index, I think is uh, like 27. It's glycemic index is like 35. And, and what that means is that when you are ingesting it, even though it really doesn't have any calories, it is impacting your, your body. It is raising blood glucose. It is raising insulin. So these processed foods contain nutrient, uh, contain uh, substances that, that are, that are affecting us um, in, in ways that we, we don't think they are, but, but in reality, they are not doing us any good. Gotcha. So you mentioned intermittent fasting, the yeah. timing of food. What, why does, why does that matter? And what, well, let's answer the why first, and then I want to get to what specific recommendations do you have around food timing? Why? So, uh, so here, here again, so I'm going to come back to the insulin, which I don't know that we're kind of uh, eye to eye on, on insulin. Um, but what, one of the things uh, that, that, I, that I teach, uh, I, I kind of have this zero, one, two, three strategy. The three of it uh, stands for three hours before bed, stop eating. And so this kind of lends its way into intermittent fasting. So let me start with intermittent fasting. Maybe people don't understand what it is. So it's really just a way of dividing your day between a period of eating and a period of not eating, a period of fasting. And so starting with this uh, three hour before bed rule, well, there's a couple of things that that will do for us. Uh, one of the main things is that when we stop eating three hours before bed, it gives our um, our bodies time to digest the food that is in our system. If we don't allow for that, we have a, um, we, we have a lot of blood flow and warmth going to our core and that will interfere with our ability to sleep. So right off the bat, we're going to be getting better sleep, which is going to help with, well, just about everything. Now, intermittent fasting then, if we're going to take that a little bit farther, it we would postpone breakfast for a, a few hours of the day. So one um, of the more popular ways to do intermittent fasting is 16-8. Um, I, I actually tell people to start with 12-12. What that means is you know, 12 hours of eating, 12 hours of, of fasting start with that, kind of get comfortable. It's kind of like if you if you ever had a, a blood test and, and your doctor said, you know, stop eating after dinner and don't eat until you are, you know, come into the office and have the, the blood test. It really is not more complicated than that. Um, but then 16-8 would be consuming all of your calories within uh, an eight hour window. Uh, and and Sachin, Dr. Sachin Panda has done a, a lot of research on in this area. Uh, he actually does a lot of mouse studies, but he's also done uh, some human studies. Um, and what he, one of the most interesting ones that he has put out there, he had he developed a smartphone app, and uh, so that people could so that he could uh, have people very easily record how much they eat and how often. They, they eat. Um, and what he found were, was that over 50% of us are, are all day grazers, right? We, we eat from the, you know, really the only time we take a break is, is the, the um, time we go to sleep and the time that we wake up. We also eat differently on the weekends and we get this, this, this uh, 
uh, this this effect of of, of uh, you know almost like traveling across time time uh, zones, and so then what he did was he took eight members out out of that study, and he um, asked them to simply shorten their eating window. Now these were eight men and women that were over overweight, um, and they were um, they were also shown from their uh, phone app that they were eating for more than 14 hours a day. And uh, they asked them to simply shorten their eating window to 10 to 12 hours. Uh, and they followed them for 16 more weeks and they found that they, um, they lost weight. I think the average was about just over seven, seven pounds. And they didn't change their diet in any way. So this was, this was kind of uh, gave some life to this idea of shortening our eating window. And what we find is that it just allows us to work with our normal um, daily circadian rhythm, our, our normal metabolic rhythm. Um, you know, we have, we have this, uh, this circadian rhythm um, that's, that's kind of uh, an, an area in our brain that's kind of triggered by light. Uh, so, it, you know, the circadian rhythm kind of is what we give credit to for waking us up and keeping us active and then at nighttime allowing us to go back to sleep. Um, and, uh, but we also have peripheral clocks and we have these clocks inside of our organs, uh, liver, um, you know, metabolically very important organs have these similar types of clocks. They are not triggered by light, they are triggered by our food intake. So when we can shorten our number of hours that we eat in a day, we um, are really uh, feeding our bodies at times when they are most able to uh, metabolically handle that food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, and um, I often cite that same study as well, the one you yeah. mentioned from Sachin Panda, and uh, I think it's a great study. They, they actually not only showed weight loss from shortening the feeding window, but the subjects import, reported improved sleep and increased energy levels at the same time. It's pretty unusual for a weight loss intervention, something that's effective for driving weight loss to simultaneously be improving uh, energy levels, because oftentimes the things that drive weight loss are are lower food intake diets where somebody actually is during, during that weight loss phase is feeling actually more fatigued. So, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of time restricted feeding in that way as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would say, you know, just to, to, uh, add on to what you were saying, another interesting thing of that study was that, um, those eight that were in the intervention study, they voluntarily opted to stay on the program for another 36 weeks, I think it was, so that they could get a full year. Now, how often do you have that, right? right. Yeah, so absolutely. you're 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 asking people to make a you know a change to their to their lifestyle, mm -hmm. and at the end of the study, they go, yeah, I think I'd like to keep doing that. So it, yeah. it really does bode well to the the power of time restricted eat, eating, which we tend to change to intermittent fasting. Yeah. So yeah, the, the line, the distinction between those two is somewhat blurry and kind of debated. Sometimes people will refer to, to 16 to eight as time restricted feeding others as, as intermittent fasting. So to some extent they're kind of interchangeable, but then there's also debate over where we should cut off that, that line of what constitutes time restricted feeding versus intermittent fasting. So I, I want to get into um, menopause yeah. and women post menopause. So this is a common thing where uh, a lot of women, after they go through menopause, put on weight or or struggle to lose weight, and the things that maybe helped them stay lean in the past don't work as well anymore. There's been some hormonal shifts that just tend to make fat storage a little bit easier for the body, um, not in not in a good way. Um, so, with that in mind, do you have? I, I guess first of all. Do you want to explain why that happens? What is the sort of hormonal milieu of the body that's driving fat storage? And then I would love to talk about if you have any specific strategies that you found uh, uniquely effective for helping women post-menopause. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a great question, right? So what brings on the, these um, the, the, the menopause uh, 
belly fat is really where a lot of women struggle. Um, and and there, that, that is after we have a drop in estrogen, uh, we, we do see that it is easier to put on weight at, in, in the abdomen. So a woman who might've been pear-shaped when all her life may notice now that it's easier to put uh, weight on in the belly. Um, why is that? They, they haven't come up with, at least I have not come across it in the research yet. <laughs> they, they do not know why exactly that is, but they do relate it to the drop in estrogen. And some of the things that we do see with the drop of estrogen is that um, there, there's a drop when we have a, a suppression of the, the female sex hormones, we have a drop in um, the resting energy expenditure or REE. Um, so like what, what that means is that uh, when we have that drop in estrogen, it, it shows also that we cannot utilize as many calories as we used to. So that's, that in itself is going to cause some, um, some weight gain as well. Um, see, now I would go in the direction of also saying that as we get older, we, our cells become less sensitive to insulin, insulin resistance, right? So uh, since insulin is that anabolic hormone that's trying to get energy nutrients into the cells, uh, when we become resistant, uh, the cells don't want to take in that um, that that energy they're resisting it and so um, we have that in, that we have a harder time getting that cleared out of the system we have a higher insulin uh, what's that going to do well one of the things that's going to drive cravings because our cells aren't really getting that the, they're not the, the nutrients might be there but they're not able to to see them so we can we can start to see that some women complain about cravings uh, being higher uh, at and menopause so I, I always talk about it as we, we kind of develop this perfect storm when we come to, to menopause as far as it creating weight gain. So we have the, the changes in our um, resting energy uh, expenditure and you know, we have the increase in belly fat. Um, these, that's alone is, is going to contribute to insulin resistance, but just simply being of, of that age is also going to increase that. Um, that can lead to, to weight gain and uh, cravings. So you know now we might be eating a little bit more, and so we're bringing that back around. And then we have things like sleep uh, disruption and you know hot flashes for women at menopause it, it's a huge issue and we can get we can get into that too if, if that's something it might be something that's of interest to your to your followers because i know that you uh, a lot of women at that age group are are in there and, and it's a struggle for 80 percent of the of the women but um you know that decrease in sleep is is also going to make it harder for our bodies to to lose weight so and then we might have some poor diet issues we might have the fact that we just don't exercise like we used to. So we, we kind of get this perfect storm. Um, so we, we need to get a, so what we have happened to lose weight then is that we have to find a way to disrupt that perfect storm. And we do that by controlling the things that we can control. And, and really that comes down to some of the things that we've already talked about, uh, your diet, intermittent fasting. Uh, those are two areas that we do have some con control over. And, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, there's a bunch of things I want to go into here. One, maybe I should have brought this up before around the the topic of intermittent fasting, but there are some people out there, um, and I haven't seen any real data to support this, but uh, there, there's a number of people out there making the claim that intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding, like for example, the sixteen eight pattern is not appropriate for women specifically. Mm -hmm. Some people saying right. that, yeah, it's okay. Maybe men, men can do this and get benefits, but for women, it's harmful. What, what's your take on that? Yeah. I'm glad you bring that up because um, I, I looked into this because I had heard that too. So there was a study in uh, 2015, possibly it, it was fairly recent uh, that was published in the journal of uh, midlife health. I believe it was, was, and uh, I have this study if you want me to send it to you, sure. but it looked at, it was a systematic review study. And so it looked at, and what those studies do is they, they look at all of the research 
out there and then they, they compile it and they have a certain question. Um, and so by compiling that, then they have like all of this research to, to look at. So they're, they're good studies. And uh, it was specifically looking at um, women, um, uh, weight gain, inter inter uh, intermittent fasting and, and, and aging. So it was looking at all of those elements. And from looking at all of these studies, they found that it, it was across the board. So it was good for intermittent fasting for, for women of all ages. It was good for weight loss. It was good for reduction of belly fat. Um, it was, um, there was some other elements as, as well. Uh, and if I could, if I could remember, but I, I'm, I'm thinking that it, there, there was health benefits uh, specifically, uh, it was possibly with cardiovascular health Im improvements as well. And they, of course, this is a, you know, a, an unbiased study. So they're going to be looking for the cons as well. And they really didn't, they really couldn't, you know, find any from the review of the literature. So, so in I, other I words, it sounds like some people just kind of made up this idea or, or this speculated that it could intermittent fasting could be harmful to women and then it kind of spread and i you know i think it, it's if you think about it it's kind of you could think of a very rational sort of reason that someone might conjure up this sort of speculation which is whenever you do any kind of prolonged fasting or even intermittent fasting, there's a sizable segment of the population that is not used to that, that is metabolically unhealthy people um, mm -hmm. where they're metabolically inflexible. They can't shift between burning carbs and fats very easily. Uh, they're prone to hypoglycemia if they have a prolonged period without eating. So there's going to be a sizable segment of people that basically have a very negative reaction to fasting. Yeah. Um, I think that's true of both men and women. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's the case that, you know, you could s s sort of splice out some gender difference where maybe that occurs in 34% of men and 36% of women or something like that, maybe that would occur. Um, but uh, I think it's easy if somebody's specializing in women and they're uh, seeing a lot of, you know, that portion of their audience of all women reporting this sort of effect and they say, hey, well, maybe it's, this is unique to women that, and you know, maybe, yeah, there's studies on men getting benefits from intermittent fasting, but I'm seeing so many women in my practice that are experiencing fatigue and hypoglycemia and, you know, are reporting all these negative effects from it. Um, so maybe this is harmful and you could, I just, I think it's kind of rational that you could see that kind of speculation emerging. Yeah. But I, I think your use of the word speculation is, it, it seems to be what it is. So, and I, and I think anytime that you have that, uh, you you do have to take it seriously, and but you you do have to also turn to the research and see okay, is there something out there that's proving that women specifically should not be doing intermittent fasting? I haven't come I haven't come across it. Yeah, neither um, have I. Yeah, yeah. So um, I I do I've at, at this point I feel it is safe now. There are you know <laughs> like anything. So intermittent fasting has become very. Um, very well known, uh, a lot of people talking about it on YouTube and things of that sort. So anytime we have something like that, you know, we have people that just go, go all in, but there, there are some things that we do have to be cautious about. Uh, and, and one thing in particular, if you've got a chronic disorder, a known disease, uh, and you're on medications that are, that are going to influence your, your blood sugar, going to influence your, your blood pressure, you, you, you have to keep your doctor in the loop that this is what you're going to be doing. And, you know, it, it is human nature. We, you know, weight loss is, is one of those things that we, you know, so many of us want to do. Uh, we, we hear about this being effective and then we, we jump right into it and we don't take into account our own personal health history. So, you know, we do, we do have to have some caution there too. Yeah. So I want to go back to, to menopause women post-menopause trying to lose weight, you've got this perfect storm that you explained and, and interrupting that perfect storm is a key part of stimulating some fat loss. So how do you do that? Do you, do you recommend taking, you know, hormonal replacement therapy? Uh, do you recommend, you know, kind of herbal botanicals to kind of optimize hormones? What's, what's your approach there for women on a very practical level? What do you recommend to them? Yeah. So um, I I don't I don't recommend 
a hormone re replacement therapy, but I, I'm not, I'm not against it. I think that's a decision between the woman and, and her doctor. Um, and, and I can talk about some supplements then, then also, uh, I, I approach it mostly from, from diet. Um, I've actually thrown this out to my, to the, the forum where I, I interact with a lot of women that are in menopause. Um, and, and actually I had done a video on, actually this was for women over, over 60. Um, uh, and I, so I asked for their input because I'm 52. So I, I didn't feel like, you know, well, you know, let me get their, get their input. And they, their reports back to me were that um, uh, keeping some of the, keeping the healthy fats in, in their diet or putting them in. Um, and we, and uh, that, that's important for a number of reasons. Let me get, let me go off on a tangent for just a little bit, but you know, healthy fats, you know, all of our cells are surrounded by fat. So every single of the billions of cells in our body is has a fatty cell membrane that that membrane needs to stay healthy because um, that is how hormones are transported they go across the the cell membrane so uh, in order to get you know the, the hormones that we need in into our cells we have to have healthy cell membranes and and that's you know starts with good good fats versus you know and getting rid of the the bad fats um, so just to come back on again, um, keeping their their carbs lower. So so here too. So uh, you know, do we need to go the entire way to, to keto? No, I I don't I don't find that to be the case at, at all. You do need to keep healthy carbohydrates in in your diet. So uh, these are your whole foods as well: uh, nuts, seeds, avocados, um, greens. Uh, but for, for me, one of the things that I teach a lot is kind of combining those healthy fats and good carbs in one particular meal a, a day, and that is a, a high fat salad. Uh, this is kind of a central thing to my, to my uh, approach to dieting. Uh, you know, I, I always tell people, if you don't like salads, you just haven't learned how to make a really good salad. So, um, you know, a, a nice big bowl, like, you know, I, I encourage women to eat a bowl that probably they would have served to their, to their family before, um, mm -hmm. but put things on there that are going to be hunger satiating and keep your blood sugar steady so that your insulin stays steady. So, um, avocados, uh, raw sunflower seeds, raw pumpkin seeds, walnuts, um, I will utilize a full fat dressing. Fats, when you're with vegetables, are going to also help with the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, some minerals that are that are going to be dependent on that. So that is, you know, that's one little trick. Just a, a good high-fat salad. Um, another thing that the women that in that over the over sixty that I asked in the forum found was intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, are, just real quick, are you a fan of omnivorous diets or, or vegan vegetarian diets? Do you have any preference on that? And like in, for example, in that salad that you were just describing, do you also have a, a serving of a lot of protein or do you, are you more on the low protein side? Um, low protein? No, a moderate protein. Uh, but I, I will utilize animal and, and plant sources. So gotcha. yeah, I haven't really brought, I brought that up, but yeah, no, you know, and uh, the quality of meats runs the gamut as well. So, um, and we, we look at certain meats that are, you know, especially, especially our, our grain fed meats, uh, they have a, a higher um, occurrence of inflammation. And, and that is a lot of times due to their, just their balance of omega threes and o omega sixes. So it kind of throws that balance out of whack where we get more of the omega-6 and that creates inflammation. Um, you know, I, we, we probably don't have time to go into inflammation, but inflammation in the body is the root of so many of our, of our chronic problems. And that goes back to our processed foods, mm -hmm. uh, creating inflammation in, in the body. And that chronic state of inflammation is, you know, really the, you know, if we're going to cut down to the the, the bare essence of, of what causes us to be unhealthy, having a lot of inflammation in our body is, is right up there. Yeah. I want to go back to the menopause thing. You mentioned the salads, intermittent fasting. 
not a huge fan of hormonal replacement therapy. Um, is there, are there any, you know, botanicals, herbs, things like that, that you found to help uh, improve hormones in, in women dealing with, you know, in women post-menopause or uh, anything that can even just mitigate symptoms like hot flashes that might disturb sleep? Yeah. Yeah. So I will, I will preface this by saying that uh, I uh, am a supplement minimalist as much as I possibly can. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some, some really great supplements out there. So, so I'm not one to, to jump on the bandwagon of, of everything. Um, there's there's got to be some evidence that it works and, and some of that evidence has to be clinical and being a woman of this age, that clinical sometimes has to be, has to meet me. So let me go over and, uh, and really these will, let's go down a path of, of, um, of hot flash supplements sure. and that will kind of encompass some of the, the things with menopause, weight gain and things of that sort. So one thing that is um, very easy for, for well, um, easy to, to get, I should say, is maca powder. Uh, it's a proven herb. And uh, it has been shown, there's, there's research into that for um, a, a lot of the problems that women uh, exper experience um, associated with menopause. One of them being hot flash relief. Uh, so when I first started getting hot flashes, um, I, that was one of the first things that I, tr that I tried and I did find it to be a, a good level of, of, of help. So, um, the plus sides of maca powder with hot flashes is that it's, uh, relatively inexpensive and fairly easy to find. You can find it on, on, uh, Amazon. I'm not sure if you'll be able to find it in your health food. It might, it might, depend if your grocery store would carry that or not, but it, it would be available online. Um, the, the challenge with it is that it's not super effective if we're talking just about hot flashes. It might be more for some women than others, so I think it's worth a shot. Uh, but uh, it, it's also a little bit difficult to, to take. So it has a very unique kind of nutty flavor and um, it doesn't mix real well. Um, so I've, I've found putting it into like a, like a, a nut milk or a cream or something like that and, and blending it, that, that will help, um, sprinkling it on food, you know, it does have that kind of nutty flavor. So, uh, and, and really to be at a therapeutic range, I believe it's something like three grams per day, which is not a small, not a real small amount. So you have that challenge. Um, then if we go to kind of what I would say is the next step, we have DHEA. Um, DHEA is a hormone that is naturally produced in our bodies, and uh, it uh, when 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 uh, we have DHEA, it, it is able to then uh, turn into estrogens and, and testosterone. Um, so uh, supplementing with that um, for some women can be beneficial. Now I've tried DHEA before too. I would kind of put it on this maybe a little bit more effective for reducing hormones. The there's some challenges with it. So on the plus side, it's, it's kind of the middle of the road um, cost-wise from the three I'm going to be sharing here. Um, easy to take. It's just a tablet right in your pill. The challenge with it is that dumping too much DHEA into our system, um, it, it's kind of a... Uh, we're dumping it at a, at a place that uh, can, can kind of um, muck up the system, so to speak. So DHEA can go to, to testosterone or to, to estrogen. And um, I question sometimes if, if it's really that beneficial to be dumping it you know, at, at, that, at that place to be taking DHEA. It, the better option is to go upstream a, a little bit. And so give our body something that it can make its own natural DHEA. And that seems to work better. Um, for me, what that ha has been is, is uh, tribulus. Um, tribulus is, uh, is actually, I, I, believe it's, I believe it's considered a weed in many, <laughs> in many places. And um, I have found this to be extremely effective for uh, hot flashes. Um, and so that's the definitely the plus side the definite minus side of it is much more expensive um i saw it on amazon the other day for uh 
you know, like a hundred dollars for, for a bottle. It's, it's an expensive. Really? Thing. Now that's, yeah, that that's, seems, that seems a little excessive to me. I, mean, I think I'm it was definitely... Amazon. I, I saw it on Amazon and I thought, wow, that's, you know, um, that's, that's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'll put another, I'll put another caveat on, on Tribulus and, um, it, it, uh, it does grow in different places all over the world, but it does, in order to be effective for, for hot flashes, it has to have um, protodiaskin in it. Uh, so, and, and that is a very select small amount. So I, I think you can find tribulus um, and maybe find cheaper, but it has to have uh, protodiaskin. So, so the one that's specifically standardized for that phytochemical is more it. expensive. Gotcha. Uh, uh, well, that's my assumption, okay. um, but that is, but, but that is the one that is going to be the most effective for hot flashes. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to mention here for hot flashes or that no. pretty much covers? Um, oh, well, you know, uh, there, there, there actually has been, um, research on, on diet as well. Uh, if I can think, think that through. There was a study, um, I think it was the American Journal of uh, Clinical Nutrition, or, uh, just a few, I think it was just a few years back, but they were looking at uh, hot flashes and, and seeing if they could draw some conclusions with diet. And, um, and what they were looked at specifically were the, the hormones that are produced from the, uh, from the hormones that are produced from the fat cells. So we have like leptin and uh, adiponectin, and they were looking at different levels of that. And they were looking at the severity of hot flashes in women. Uh, and they found that um, the women that had the most, the, the, the worst hot flashes, the most severe, uh, actually had higher levels of leptin and lower levels of, of adiponectin. And, and uh, so leptin, um, just, you know, I'm getting into the weeds here a little bit, but I'll just try and do it quickly. Um, leptin is a, a hormone. I always say leptin is the one we like because uh, when we have a lot of leptin, we're, we're not as hungry. It kind of a hunger takes away hunger. Um, the challenge though with leptin is that we can become leptin resistant. So higher levels of, of leptin in your blood is not necessarily a, a good thing. It probably means that you're, you're not utilizing leptin that well. The, the other challenge is leptin is produced by, by fat cells. So, exactly. so you got to be careful if you just say, Hey, more is better. That be, yeah. the best way to get more is to have more fat. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So there's definite drawbacks there. Um, you know, a, a, a is, is, uh, is associated with low inflammation. Uh, so we want to keep that, um, uh, we, we want to keep that, uh, I'm backward here. We we want to keep that that up. Um, so this study found that um, most more severe um, hot flashes were associated with higher leptin and, and lower adiponectin, and and they were drawing the 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 uh, conclusion also with insulin resistance. So they their conclusion was that the more insulin resistant a woman was, the more severe their their hot flashes were. So they're again eating in a way. You know, it, what I would say is eating in a way that, that's going to keep that insulin low so that your body's not needing to, you know, utilize that as much as is going to be beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the last thing I want to ask you about is sugar and taste buds. And I know this is potentially a, a big topic that you could go very in depth on, but maybe we could do a, just a short version of how consumption of refined sugar and processed foods uh, trains the taste buds in a negative way and, and kind of your key tip or key tips to retrain your taste buds. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's a, it's an interesting thing, but sugar is such an intense flavor that it, it, it dulls the, the taste buds. And uh, that, that's not just something that you, you say uh, there was a, a study um, there was a study that uh, that looked to prove this connection, and what they what they did was that they um, put a, one group on a low sugar diet for, for I believe it was three months, and then they had a control group. and And uh, at the end of three months, after being on low sugar diet, uh, or you know, as the study was going on, they brought them these participants in every month, and they gave them sweetened pudding. And so after a month of being low sugar, uh, no difference. Like they both rated at the same sweetness level. After the at this the start of the second month, the people that had been on the low sugar diet 
uh, rated the pudding much sweeter than those that were just, you know, controls. They were just eating it. And so what that study showed is that when we get off of sugar, we become more sensitive to sugar. And, and then we don't need as much. We don't want as much. So, uh, so that it's, an inter it's an interesting thing that um, kind of the takeaway is that you can train your taste buds to not like the taste of, of sugar as much, uh, but you got to hang in there for at least a month, right? So that's kind of the takeaway that we can do from that study. Uh, so so that's, that, that is actually really a big part of my approach. Um, and that is my zero, one, two, three strategy, which you know, your, your uh, followers can certainly go get um, from my, my channel, uh, but it's yeah, basic. With, yeah, so I would love to actually wrap up with that, like your, your sort of top three strategies that you wanna leave with people or, or four Mm -hmm. Um, if it's zero, one, two, three. Yep. Uh, so, and, and you can kind of do a, a surface treatment of this. If you want to send people back to your, to your website where they can download, uh, mm -hmm. like a PDF or, or something like that, or, or a video training or, or something that takes them through this process more in depth, feel free. But what, what would be your top three or four kind of simple strategies that you want to leave people with? Yeah. So that is, that's zero, one, two, three, right? So four habits and, and there, it really stands. It's a, a, a way of thinking of four habits that, that you can do on a daily basis that, that will really take care of a, a lot of the core problems of a diet. So real quickly, and, and they can go over to drbeckyfitness.com. It's D-R-B-C-K-Y. So just the abbreviation, um, uh, drbeckyfitness.com and, and they'll see a, the free button so they can download, uh, a PDF that has these four habits on it. Uh, and then there's also a, a free video series that ex explains how to get the most out of it. Uh, but real quickly, what it, the 0123 stands for is zero sugar, one large salad, like I mentioned earlier, two cups of cooked non-starchy vegetables, um, and three hours before bed, stop eating. So by doing those four things, you, you've taken away the worst diet destroyer, sugar. But you're also giving your body a a, a, just an influx of volume because you're eating a lot of vegetables and nutrients. And that's going to help with everything from the sugar, you know, getting the sugar cravings, getting the withdrawal symptoms over with, um, keeping you satisfied. Uh, and then three hours before bed, you stop eating. And that lends itself so nicely into the beginnings of intermittent fasting. So it's a really great place to, to start. Um, I think some, some people it's, it's, it's challenging to think, you know, zero sugar, do, do I have to do that the rest of my life? You know, I, I talk about that in the, in the series and how to handle it and how to set up short-term goals. So, um, it's, it's a scary thing to hear. Um, but I've coached many, many people to a sugar-free life. I was a sugar addict and I, what I like to say is I have the cavities to prove it. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm living, I live a sugar-free life now. It, it is possible. And the, the life on the other side of sugar is so much better. <laughs> Beautiful. Becky, thank you so much for your time. This was great. I really, really enjoyed it. And again, for people listening, they can go to drbeckyfitness.com and they can, what can they get on your site? There, there's some kind of free download. Yeah. Just go to the top of the website um, and you'll see the word free. Uh, if you click on that, you can, uh, you'll be able to put your name and email in. You can get my, um, download of, of that has a nice little PDF that has the zero one, two, three on it. You can copy it off and put it on your refrigerator. Um, and then it has four videos too with it that explains how to get, how to get the most out of that strategy. Excellent. Great. Becky, thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed this and uh, look forward to connecting again in the future. Great. I'd love to. Thanks. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.